in uttering the sentence, you impart all kinds of information that is not contained in the sentence itself. So what I want to say is the sentence Hesperus is phosphorus, when uttered, imparts much information that is not actually contained in the sentence itself. And as a matter of fact, on my view, the sentence Hesperus is phosphorus contains no more information and no different information than the sentence Hesperus is Hesperus. So um, you are a proponent of a uh, so-called direct reference theory. Yes. And the key opponent to that view has been the Frege puzzles. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, for starters, could you introduce your solution uh, that will be explained in fairly ordinary language for those of us that aren't trained in philosophy? And um, how do you um, think you can solve them on direct reference theory? Okay, I didn't, I didn't quite catch the last part of your question. How do you believe they can be solved on direct reference? Yes, theory? okay, all right. So, uh, there are various uh, puzzles that arise in the philosophy of language, uh, which you re just referred to as the Frege puzzles, um, one of which is called Frege's puzzle. Uh, by the way, I take some uh, pride in the fact, uh, I believe I was the first one to call it Frege's puzzle. Um, and now it's standardly called Frege's Puzzle. I sort of wrote a book on it, and the book, the title of the book was Frege's Puzzle. Uh, at the time that I wrote the book, that's not what people called it. Um, so uh, now it is called Frege's Puzzle, and it's easy to state. Um, so the basic idea is to contrast sentences of the form A equals A with a corresponding sentence of the form A equals B. We could also put these two sentences in the form A is A versus A is B. But the second sentence, A equals B or A is B, um, has to be true. So the question is, if A equals B is true, if A, is B, if A really is B, um, how can that differ at all in the content, in the information that it uh, contains or expresses from the information contained in A equals A. Isn't it just the very same information? This the information that A equals B, wouldn't that be the very same information as the information that A equals A? Um, it's hard to see how they could differ, um, how they could be two different pieces of information, how they could be two different propositions, A equals A and A equals B. To, to give the stock example that's usually given, um, the uh, planet Venus was known as the morning star or phosphorus, and it was also known as the evening star or Hesperus. Um, and so we can construct two sentences of the form that create the puzzle by means of Hesperus equals Hesperus uh, versus Hesperus equals phosphorus. Both of these sentences seem to say the same thing. They both seem to say that uh, the planet Venus uh, is itself. Hesperus is Hesperus, talks about the planet Venus, and it says that it's itself. But if you think about it, the sentence Hesperus is Phosphorus does the same thing. It says of the planet Venus that it is it. Uh, and so the question is, how can these two sentences differ at all in content? Um, now, you could grab the bull by the horns and say they don't. They don't differ in content. They have the very same content. And that's, in fact, exactly what I do say about this. Um, question. But it's not enough to just take a bold stance like that and drop it and leave it alone. The problem with that position, which I do endorse, is that there seems to be weighty evidence against it. Uh, and Frege cited some of this evidence. There's a great deal more that Frege didn't even cite that could be said against this theory. So um, the first thing that can be said against the theory that they have the same content is that the sentence Hesperus is Hesperus is a logical truth, it's a truth of logic. Um, whereas the sentence Hesperus is phosphorus is not a truth of logic. Uh, and so already that seems to suggest that they, they differ in content. Um, it doesn't entail that they do, but it strongly suggests that they differ in content, one of them being a logical truth um, and the other one being um, not a logical truth. One of the results of the first being a logical truth, one of the consequences, is that it's trivial. Uh, it 
it doesn't contain any significant information that Hesperus is Hesperus. Uh, whereas Hesperus is Phosphorus is, seems to be non-trivial. It seems to be, well, the word that's often used is the sentence is informative. It tells us information. It contains information that one wouldn't know a priori. Uh, as Frege put it, A equals A is analytic, or at least according to Kant would be called analytic, whereas the sentence A equals B is synthetic. Um, also, A equals A is a priori. A equals B is a posteriori, that is knowable only by recourse to experience. Um, so all of these differences, one, you know, the logical status, the informativeness, the uh, a priori versus a posteriori, uh, the uh, informativeness versus uninformativeness, all of these differences between the two sentences strongly suggest, some would say that they even prove that these two sentences differ in content, that the sentence A equals A does not just say exactly what A equals B says. Uh, and in fact, A equals B is much more, contains much more significant information. And so it doesn't just mean that Venus is Venus. And so um, I, uh, that puts the burden uh, of responsibility on, uh, puts the responsibility on me to um, explain how I could maintain that these two sentences in fact don't differ in content, that they have the very same content. So in my book on this topic, um, I argued that um, the sentence A equals B or uh, Hesperus is Phosphorus is in the relevant sense, no more informative than A equals A or Hesperus is Hesperus, that in the relevant sense of informative, um, it is in fact uninformative. And it really does say that Hesperus is Hesperus. It says the same thing as that Hesperus is Hesperus, uh, which means I have to explain why it seems not to. Why does it appear to be that this sentence says something more significant than that the mere claim that Hesperus is Hesperus or that about Venus, that it is it. Um, and so I give an explanation as to um, why this would appear to be the case, even though, as if I'm right, it's not the case. Um, and the explanation is somewhat complicated, um, but in bare bones, let me just put it this way, um, I think people tend to confuse two different propositions, let me call them. Um, one is the actual information or proposition that's expressed or contained in the sentence, which is the semantic content of a sentence. Um, people tend to confuse that with different information. In fact, with information, for example, the, the proposition or information that the sentence itself is true. Um, that's a different proposition from the proposition that's actually expressed by the sentence. And in fact, somebody could know that the sentence is true without even knowing which proposition it, it expresses. For example, if the sentence is in a language that one doesn't speak, uh, one can have it on good authority that the sentence is, is true uh, and yet not know what it means and, and maybe not even know the very information that is contained in the sentence itself. So this is a confusion that, ha that one has to guard against. Uh, it's very, very common. Uh, I work in the philosophy of language and I see this confusion all the time. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I would say the sentence only appears to be informative because it is informative to be told that the sentence is true. But that's different information from the information actually contained in the sentence itself. So basically, my solution, the way I want to maintain uh, direct reference theory um, in the face of Frege's puzzle is to make a sharp distinction uh, and scrupulously follow this uh, between the information that's actually contained in a sentence and the entirely separate information that the, about the sentence itself, that it's true. Let me mention, by the way, since you, you mentioned direct reference, but we haven't yet defined it. Um, so direct reference is the view, the thesis, that certain expressions, and in particular proper names, but other expressions in addition to proper names, uh, and by the way, not all expressions, but particular expressions, including proper names, um, have as their semantic content 
simply what they designate, what they um, refer to or denote, that is all there is. That exhausts um, the semantic content of the proper name or other expressions that are also directly referential. So to say that a proper name is a device of direct reference or that it's directly referential is to say that its semantic content just is and entirely exhausted by the thing designated by the name. That's all there is to the semantic content of a name. Frege, of course, rejected direct reference. Um, I might also mention, because there's a lot of uh, confusion about this, that um, Saul Kripke is not actually a theorist of direct reference, although he's often sort of seen as the sort of godfather of direct reference theory. He himself has never actually endorsed it. And I've talked to him about this many times. Um, and I think he's even to this day not prepared to endorse direct reference in the stark way that I've posed it just now. So let me know if you have further questions, but that's my my attempt to answer your question. Um, and yeah, there is a follow-up question, which is, as a direct reference theorist, do you deny that there are different senses in which synonymous words can be used? I'm sorry, I don't quite get the question. So are there different senses in which synonymous words may be used? Yeah, like when you say Hesperus and Bosphorus, can somebody say that Hesperus refers to a particular sense of the same object, like Venus in this case? No, I, that, that would be a mistake. So uh, the name Hesperus designates the planet, uh, and so does the name Phosphorus. Now, Frege postulated that names like Hesperus and Phosphorus have, in addition to what they designate, um, a sense. And let, let me let me explain for, let me back up just a, sec, a little bit. When I talk about an expression designating something, I mean the expression stands for that thing. The expression is an expression for that thing. Uh, it denotes that thing or it refers to that thing. It's the object that the expression designates or stands for. So I call that designating. An expression designates an object. And Frege, uh, by the way, Frege called it bedeutung, um, which is the German word for actually words. It means meaning, though that's a little bit deceptive. He means designa designation by bedeutung. Um, but he postulated that expressions have, in addition to their designatum, in addition to the thing that they designate, a sense. And the sense is something like a conceptualization or a conceptual representation or a conceptual way of thinking about the designatum, about the thing designated by the expression. So the distinction for Frege, which is central to his philosophy of semantics, is between the sense of an expression and what he called the bedeutung, the uh, designatum of an expression. So the name Hesperus, Frege would insist, and so would I, designates the planet Venus. So does the name Phosphorus. These are two expressions that are what are what's, what are said to be uh, co-designated, meaning that they designate this. There's a single thing that they both designate. Um, but Frege would add that they cannot be strictly synonymous. They're co-designated, but they're not strictly synonymous. To be strictly synonymous, is to have the same sense. And there can be expressions that have the same sense, but Frege would argue um, the names Hesperus and Phosphorus are not strictly synonymous. And in fact, he would argue for this using Frege's puzzle itself as an argument that seems to show that these two names, Hesperus and Phosphorus, are not strictly synonymous, even though they're co-designative. By the way, on Frege's views, if expressions are strictly synonymous, if they have the same sense, then they will automatically, ipso facto, uh, they will be co-designative as well, because the sense of an expression determines the designatum of the expression, so that if two expressions have the very same sense, then the very same designatum is determined for both of them. But converse isn't the case on Frege's view. We can have two expressions like Hesperus and Phosphorus that are co-designative, but differ uh, in terms of their uh, sense. So I don't know if that answers the question. 
that, that does. So Bait has a language question. I'll give, get him on a uh, voice chat. But before, there's a couple of other questions in the text. And one of them is are slightly trivial that concern your personal life. One of them is, uh, do you hold to theism or atheism? I'm an atheist, uh, but that's a tricky question. Uh, so let me let me tell you a more complicated answer to that. Um, I have a theory um, which was influenced heavily by Kripke's theory of fictional characters. Um, so, um, for example, the fictional character of Sherlock Holmes is that's a famous. He can actually he might be the most famous fictional character there is. But take any fictional character, you know, um, Harry Potter, uh, Forrest Gump. Um, take any any fictional character. Um, I believe that fictional characters are real. They really do exist. Uh, Harry Potter is a real thing. It really does exist. Uh, so does Sherlock Holmes. Um, in fact, I would go even further, but now the things I'm going to say about fictional characters, I think, are common sense, uh, but they're not the way we normally talk about them. So I've been talking about Sherlock Holmes, and I've been saying he, but in fact, I shouldn't be calling it he. I should be calling it it. Uh, because fictional characters, on my view, do not have the properties that are attributed to them in the stories, in the fiction. In particular, Sherlock Holmes is not a human being. He's not a man. Um, he's not male. So I really should say it. Sherlock Holmes, it is a fictional character. And it wasn't born in the way that humans are born. It was created, um, but it wasn't born. Uh, Sherlock Holmes was created by Arthur Conan Doyle, the storyteller. So here's the idea. Storytellers create things. They create stories. Um, storytelling is, or at least um, making up a story, let's put it, put it that way. Making up a story is a way of creating something. Uh, and the storyteller is to be credited with creation, with creating uh, the story. Um, uh, it's not just that they discovered the story. They actually created it. They brought it into existence. Uh, the story is real. It's a real thing, and it was created by the storyteller. Uh, the story includes characters. Stories have characters. Characters are also created as part of the story. They are components of the story. And so fictional characters, on my view, are real things, but they're not to be thought of as having the very properties that are attributed to them in the story. So in particular, Sherlock Holmes is not a human being. Sherlock Holmes is not a detective. Um, Harry Potter is not a wizard. Those are all the properties that are attributed to them in their stories. What Sherlock Holmes and Harry Potter are is they are fictional characters. And those are abstract entities. Those are entities that don't exist in real space. And um, well, let's just say they don't ex exist in physical space at all. Um, they are ra rather the inventions of a storyteller. Of a storyteller. Um, so I say I'm an atheist. However, on my view, God, the uh, Judeo-Christian God, is um, a fictional character. In fact, I would say rather than calling it a fictional character, I would call it a mythical character. Uh, a myth is the same sort of thing as a fiction. The, di the primary difference between a myth and a fiction is that the fiction is pretense, uh, whereas the myth is actually believed. A myth is basically a theory that's false, but it is believed to be true. And so I want to say that um, <laughs> my, my phone is talking to me. Let me turn it off. Um, so what I, what I want to say is um, the Judeo-Christian God is a, is a mythical God. Uh, that means it's a real thing because it's just as real as Sherlock Holmes or Harry Potter or any of these fictional characters, it's, it's got the same status as, as they do. So it, it does exist, it's a real thing. But on my view, um, it's not a real God, it's not a real deity. And so in that sense, I think I'm an atheist, but I want, I want to make it clear, I think God exists. I just think that God is a mythical entity rather than a real deity, a real God. I see. Uh, another one of these trivial questions from actually one of our like uh, junior moderators. Um, 
and uh, they want to ask, you've said that you are uh, friends with Saul Kripke. Uh, we knew as much. Uh, assuming you find this interview hospitable, would you be willing to give a word of recommendation for Dr. Kripke to do an interview similar to yours? Oh, sure. Uh, I would um, do that through his assistant, um, Romina Padro. Uh, that's the best way to get information through to him. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to recommend to him that he do this. Sure. It's wonderful, wonderful. And, and now I'm going to say that that would be very good. Um, of course, we would also like a second interview with you, but that's too much. But anyways, yeah, uh, yeah uh, your word of recommendation to Dr. Kripke would be just amazing. Uh, so let's move on to bait. No, before that, we have another question about direct reference theory. Um, on direct reference theory, uh, if someone says that Hesperus is not phosphorus, um, would you have to maintain that the person is contradicting himself and not merely mistaken? Very good question. So suppose somebody says Hesperus is not phosphorus. And in fact, I, I would say that if somebody says that, somebody first of all, somebody can say that sincerely. Somebody might um, have been introduced, introduced to the names Hesperus and Phosphorus via descriptions like uh, the evening star and the morning star, and not realize that there's in fact a single uh, heavenly body, a, a single uh, planet that's being designated by these words. And so such a person might well assert very sincerely, might utter the sentence Hesperus is not Phosphorus. Um, and the fact that the person can utter this sentence sincerely, I think indicates that the person actually does believe that Hesperus is not phosphorus. I think it would be incorrect to say that the speaker does not even believe what they say. So I think the speaker does believe that Hesperus is not phosphorus. However, the question was, are they contradicting themselves in saying that Hesperus is not phosphorus? Well, they, they I would say, are asserting and thereby believing um, a logical falsehood, something that is inconsistent, um, because the truth, I'm sorry, the proposition that they are asserting is the proposition that Venus isn't Venus. And that's a logical inconsistency. By the way, they will probably adjoin their assertion that Hesperus is not phosphorus with the assertion that Hesperus is Hesperus. Like, you know, one would imagine that what they would say is, Hesperus is Hesperus, but Hesperus is not phosphorus. If they say that much, they've actually contradicted themselves. So yes, I think that a person who says that is actually contradicting him herself uh, in saying that. Of course, they can't be faulted for doing so. They can't be uh, criticized for being um, for asserting a contradiction, on my view, as if they should be able to see a priori that they're asserting a contradiction. Um, rather, that would be to confuse the content of their assertion with the proposition that the sentences that they've uttered or assent to are true sentences. That's a different piece of information. So I want to say one can actually believe contradictory propositions and yet not be uh, faulted for doing so if the proposition is presented to that speaker, to that person, in a way that doesn't reveal the fact that it's a contradiction. Um, and so I think this is, it's a, it's a rather difficult case to make, but I do actually go through a, a lot of pain to try to make the case that one can actually be self-contradictory in one's beliefs and yet not be faulted for that. But the point of is, yes, they do contradict themselves. They are inconsistent. Wonderful explanation, uh, Professor Salman. Okay, a couple of voice questions, and we're gonna start with desired. I'm not sure if you're ready, Bait. You can just message me. I don't know if you were planning to, so maybe I put you on the spot. But yeah, desired. Go ahead. Sorry, what's is this a question for me? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I I was wondering if you have ever run a thought experiment in which you have questioned the preset supposition of the external world being external is that necessary is it necessary to just blatantly accept that the external world created you i'm not sure i understand the question it, uh, uh, basically holding not that i 
am a Brandon of that creating everything, but uh -huh. not holding either position as true. So as it were, suspending judgment. As yes, to whether... like an atheist would towards gods, but I hold... More an agnostic would, right? An agnostic. Uh, yes, You're an agnostic, yeah. An agnostic to whether I am the only thing that exists or the world created me. Have you ever done anything along those lines or well, heard you know, of anything probably, along those lines? Yeah, so not in my work, um, but you're asking if I've ever thought a thought like that, Leo, might I be the only consciousness in the universe? Might there not even be in a, a, a physical universe at all? Might this all be a state of mind uh, rather than perception of an external world? And I'm sure I've had such thoughts and, and entertained such thoughts, uh, especially, oh, you know, in junior high school and high school, perhaps. Um, but I quickly came to the conclusion that that probably isn't the case. I don't want to say that I can prove it's not the case. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to go so far as to say, you know, I have conclusive proof that there is an external world or that um, there's much more consciousness in the universe than just my own. Um, that's the problem of other minds. Uh, I don't think I can say that I can prove any of that stuff. Um, but I, for many years now, have never really seriously entertained that I'm the only consciousness in the universe or that there is no external world, uh, no physical universe around me. I'm completely convinced that there is and that I perceive it. Um, I don't doubt that my perceptions are not completely accurate, uh, that there's much more to the world than what I see and perceive, uh, and that, in fact, in many respects, the way the world appears to me may not be an accurate depiction of it, or at least not completely so. Um, but I still believe that there is an external world. Uh, but as I say, uh, in fact, I think I would even go so far as to say that I know that there is an external world, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that I have any proof of it. So that raises Wonderful. a difficult epistemological, it's, an, it's a difficult epistemological situation to be in, to claim to know something, but to also not have proof for it. And also even to entertain the possibility that I'm wrong. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think I'm not. Okay. Um, and a little bit of a follow-up there. Uh, Dr. Um, Salman, uh, you hold to semantic externalism, correct? So how would uh, this brain in a bet scenario be compatible with content externalism? Uh, so what was the question? How to, how to reconcile a brain in the bat? Is that what you said? Yeah, how, how would you reconcile a brain in a bat scenario with content externalism? Um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so as I said, I, I feel like I know that I'm not a brain in a vat and that I live in an external world that's more or less as it appears to me, although it's not exactly the way it seems to me. Um, and so I do think that my, the, um, let's say the meanings of my words are determined by the environment that I find myself in. Now, were I to be a brain in a vat, if, I, if it turns out that I'm wrong, in my belief that the uh, external world is more or less the way it appears. Um, and it turns out that I'm actually a brain in a vat or I'm actually being, oh, victimized by an evil genius or an evil demon. Uh, that, the necess kind of that necessitates an external mind if you're being tortured. Sorry oh, to interrupt. So just, just, that would okay, so suppose that I'm the only consciousness in the universe um, and that the universe is not um, the way it appears, maybe I'm not even in a physical world at all. Um, what about the meanings of my words? Uh, I don't really have a definite view about that. I don't feel like I'm committed to, um, well, I guess to what you're calling semantic externalism. I don't feel like I'm committed to saying, well, in that case, my word, um, uh, horse, uh, let's say, uh, really means something in the brain and the vat world, in the internal world rather than the external world. I don't think that's the case. So if that's what, ex if that's what semantic externalism is, then uh, I may be not a semantic externalist.
Okay, wonderful. Uh, so a couple of other questions and we'll get to bait. Um, so one question is, uh, what is your view of the mind? Are you a physicalist or a non-physicalist when it comes to the mind? Oh, I'm definitely a non-physicalist. I think the mind is not a physical thing. The, uh, the brain is, in some sense, the organ of the mind. It's the organ of consciousness. Um, but by the way, a, a brain can be, you know, can be functioning and yet be so damaged as not to produce consciousness. But nevertheless, the organ of consciousness, I'm convinced, is the human brain. At least the organ of human consciousness is the, uh, the human brain. Um, but I would say consciousness is definitely not the brain itself. Um, and it is something non-physical. So I'm definitely not a physicalist about the mind. I'm more or less identifying the mind here with consciousness. Yeah. Um, and is that a view that uh, Dr. Kripke shares, uh, the mind non-physicalism? Oh, I'm almost certain that he does, yeah. I've never, I don't recall having talked to him directly about this, but in the conversations that I've had with him, we just take it for granted that the sort of the, the mental realm is not the same thing as the physical realm. And of course, Kripke is famous for having argued for a kind of dualism in the third lecture of Naming a Necessity, which I highly recommend. Um, you know, so I'm pretty sure, I, I think I can state with confidence that, that uh, Saul Kripke thinks that the mind is not just a physical entity. Of course, there's gonna be interaction between the mind and, and the brain. Uh, that's sometimes called interactionism. Uh, and I think Kripke probably believes that as well. Um, so that creates the mind-body problem is how to explain or how to understand that there can be any interaction between the mind and the brain. But um, aside from that worry, um, I do think that there is interaction between the mind and the brain, whereas the mind is not physical, the, the brain is physical. It's a physical object. Wonderful. Uh, okay, uh, Bait, go ahead, and uh, then we'll get back to text questions and a couple of other voice questions. So my, my question was, can you uh, be pointing to the same physical apple, but be referring to different uh, content about the apple, for example, a red apple versus a sour apple, therefore the words you're using has different semantic content, even if it's pointing to the same object. So let me get the question straight. So I point to an apple, I'm thinking of it as a red apple, or maybe I'll even say that's red. Uh, whereas another person, maybe somebody I'm speaking with, points to the same apple and says that's sour. Um, is, that, is that the kind of question yes. that you're asking here? Um, and I'm not sure what you're asking me about this situation, but I would say that we're definitely designating and speaking about or thinking about a single thing, which is the apple itself. Um, though we're thinking of it in different ways, I'm thinking of it as a red object, uh, and my conversation partner is thinking of it as a sour tasting object. Um, nevertheless, I think we are both thinking about a single thing, which is the apple itself. Um, of course, my conversation partner might be wrong in, in thinking that it's sour, or maybe the person has actually tasted the apple and knows that it is sour tasting. Uh, I could be wrong in thinking that it's red, uh, but under normal circumstances, I would be correct in thinking that it's red. Um, but either one of us, both of us could be mistaken in what we think about the apple. I would just say we are designating the same thing, but having different thoughts about it. I'm merely saying that the intended meaning differs even if it's pointed to the same object. Therefore, the semantic content, as in the meaning, differs. Yeah. So what I want to say is the meaning doesn't differ. If we, if I point to the apple and I say that's red, and my partner points to the apple and says that's sour tasting, um, I don't think that the word that, the demonstrative that we're using, um, differs at all in meaning one to the other. I think we both use the word that with the same meaning for the same object. Of course, the predicates that we're that we're attaching to this namely is red and is sour tasting, they don't mean the same thing because they, they're they just not synonymous expressions. They don't mean the same thing in my idiolect. They don't mean the same thing in my partner's idiolect. So that, the, the two sentences that we utter differ in semantic content, but the mere 
demonstrative that said while pointing to the apple means the same thing in my idiolect as it does in my partner's idiolect. Say that Hesperus and the Phosphorus carry different predicates. What's the question again? Hesperus and Phosphorus do what? Carry with predicates? different predicates, as in the one is talking about visibility during dawn, other in the evening, therefore they carry different predicates. So what I want to say is that the names Hesperus and Phosphorus, in fact, all names, but let's take these two names in particular, they don't incorporate predicates at all. They're not predicates. Um, they don't incorporate predicates in their semantic content. Um, they're just very fundamentally different sorts of things from predicates. Um, they are what logicians would call singular terms. Um, in fact, I would go even further and say that a proper name is what Bertrand Russell called a logically proper name or a proper name in the strict logical sense. Now, Russell himself famously held that ordinary proper names are not logically proper names or names in the strict logical sense. I am deviating from Russell here. I'm claiming that ordinary proper names, names including names like Hesperus and Phosphorus, are in fact logically proper names, names in the strict logical sense. Just to call them logically proper names is basically to say that they are devices of direct reference. Sometimes these are called million names uh, after John Stuart Mill. Um, in any case, the idea is these are singular terms whose semantic content is just what they designate. There are no predicates involved in their semantic content. Um, the only way that a predicate might be relevant to the semantic content of a proper name is that you might rely on predicates to do what Kripke calls fixing the reference of the proper name. You may employ predicates to that end, but the semantic content of the predicate that you're using does not end up in the semantic content of the name itself. That's something that Kripke emphasizes. Uh, and so I would say um, the names Hesperus and Phosphorus, though they may be associated with different predicates, that association is not semantic. Um, it's at most what I would call pre-semantic, um, and it has nothing to do with the semantic content of the name itself. The semantic content of the name is just the planet in this case, or in the case of the apple, the apple itself. That's my answer. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Salman, for that answer. Uh, Dur would like to ask a question. Sure. Or get on mic and engage with you. Go ahead, Dur. Hey, uh, thanks for doing the same. Hey, um, I had a quick question about, a, I thought a very interesting argument you gave um, some years ago, I think it was a response. I, I think it was a response to Cook. Um, he had a paper, and he he made this claim that if you have a certain transworld identity, there's going to be some sort of qualitative um, fact about this identity between the two individuals, say in world W one and world W two, such that they're identical. And you give this argument where you say that it's actually not the case that that's true. Um, so my question was. You mentioned something that even if you say fix uh, the identity to one world and you have say some um, individual X is identical to X, um, even there, there's not gonna be a fact about some qualitative character aside from you mentioned um, their possible existence in virtue of which that identity holds. If you could just briefly explain what you mean by the possible existence part, but also as maybe a follow up, What's stopping someone from saying that there is a, a property, namely it's some sort of property of being in a small equivalence class and hold and, and, and making Leibniz's law true such that they're identical? Uh, if X and Y are exactly alike in every respect, if they're indiscernible, in other words, then they're the same thing. The next is Y. So Leibniz believed both of these principles, the identity of indiscernibles and the indiscernibility of identicals. Um, so here's the thesis that I'm now going to argue against, uh, the thesis is that if X is Y, if there's a fact that X is Y, that very fact of the identity between X and Y must be grounded in their indiscernibility, in their being exactly alike, at least in some respects, at least in a broad range of respects, or maybe in all respect. Maybe it's going to be grounded in their um, indistinguishability, their indiscernibility in all respects. Okay. And what I argued is that's not the case, um, that 
identity is not in fact grounded in or holds only in virtue of relations of similarity or relations of indiscernibility between X and Y or any kinds of any kind of qualitative facts about X and Y. I'll make one exception and say perhaps one could argue that the identity of X and Y is grounded in X's existence. But that's the only fact that I would say potentially an identity fact can be grounded in or hold in virtue of. I actually don't think it even requires being uh, grounded in existence at all. So let me just now say publicly, I don't even think it's grounded in existence. So let, let's leave that out of it too. And so here's the argument. If, the, if there is a fact that X equals Y, the kind of fact that my opponent thinks has to be grounded in something qualitative about X and Y, if there is a fact that X equals Y, that's because X is Y. Um, well, the fact that X is Y, I claim, is, well, I not only claim this, I think I can prove this. Um, the fact that X is Y just is the fact that X is X. That has to be what it is. Uh, if it's not the fact that X equals X, then X isn't Y. So if it's true that X is Y, that very fact is just the fact that X is X. Well, the fact that X is X is a truth of logic. Um, it's something that holds by virtue of logic. Uh, there's nothing that it's grounded in in terms of the relationship between X and itself, uh, in terms of uh, indistinguishability or indiscernibility or anything of that sort. Uh, it's just a it's just a brute fact about X that X is X. A brute fact. It's not grounded in or obtains only in virtue of other things. It holds in virtue only of itself. And so I say the fact that X is X is not grounded in anything else. And if X is Y, that's the fact that X is X. And so it's the it's going to have the same feature of not being grounded in anything. Now, I don't know if I've addressed your question fully, but. Uh, right. Yeah. But, so that was very helpful. So just to be clear, um, if someone were to say, for instance, that, well, all we just mean, like all we could mean by identity is some appeal to, for instance, um, the thing I mentioned before, Leibniz's law. Would you say, would you say agree that's sort of begging the question against someone who, for instance, thinks hexades exist? Uh, someone who claims that um, identity has to be understood in terms of some other relation like indiscernibility? Yeah, yeah. So like someone just says, well, of course, identity has to be because of qualitative characteristics. That's just what it means. Like, would you agree mm -hmm. that's like a, a question begging thing to say to someone who doesn't, for instance, think that uh, someone who doesn't hold to yeah. the view? Right. I, I'm hesitant to call it question begging. Let me say why. Uh, to say that a position begs the question, um, people often misunderstand this as if it means merely that um, the person that the assertion is posed to um, will not accept it. And, they, and it's maybe even known in advance that they won't accept this assertion. Uh, but the mere fact that you give an argument that, in, that employs an assertion that your opponent, we know, rejects, does not mean that you're begging the question. To, to say that something begs the question is to say something stronger than just that you're asserting something your opponent rejects. Uh, it's really to say something like you're asserting something that for its own epistemic justification um, requires uh, perhaps something that the opponent rejects. So that the only way it could be epistemically justified, the only way you could be justified in asserting it is um, something that's illegitimate in the in the in the um, status of the argument between that you're having um, so I'm a little bit hesitant to say that one who claims that identity is always grounded in indiscernibility or what you've been calling Leibniz's law um, that that automatically begs the question what I would say is it doesn't cut any ice um, there's sure. there's a difference of opinion here. And if that's the best you've got to argue me out of my position, we're pretty much at bedrock already. Right. Um, so yes, I would say, look, uh, hexiotism, thisness, uh, the view of uh, the view that there are thisnesses, um, is precisely the view that um, 
the quality of being this very thing, of being X, is not some qualitative uh, feature of X, but just a bare bones property of identity with X. Um, and yeah, somebody could reject that, um, but there, if they argue against axiotism by citing this sort of thing, that identity must be grounded in indiscernibility, um, well, it doesn't cut any ice. It's it's precisely what I reject, right? Sure. So, yeah. So eh, I won't call it question begging, but let's say it doesn't. I don't think it really um, makes a, a makes a any kind of an advance in the argument. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful. And uh, we have a metaphysics question um, about uh, free will, and basically, what is the position that you hold to, and why? That's a good question. I've never written on free will. Uh, and I have to confess that one of the reasons I've never written on the topic is that I don't have a well-defined view on free will. Um, there is a view that's called compatibilism, or at least there used, it used to be called compatibilism, on which um, free will was, perfect, was thought to be perfectly compatible with uh, determinism. I've always been suspicious of compatibilism. I've always thought, no, if you if you think that the world is completely determined, um, you really have given up on the at least the kind of free will that we think we have. Um, so I'm not at all inclined towards what used to be called compatibilism. Maybe it still is called that. I don't know. Um, so that, that would mean that, okay, the, the, the choice is stark and clear. Either determinism is true or free will, or there is free will. Um, I can't have it both ways, the way the compatibilists would like. Um, so what is it? Uh, and I'm afraid to say that my inclination is against free will. I'm inclined to think that we don't really have the kind of freedom that appears to us we have, it seems, I'm afraid that it might be an illusion. Um, but I haven't really thought about the topic hard enough that I think my opinions on the question ought to matter. <laughs> I just think, I don't really know what to say about free will. I'm <coughs> somewhat skeptical, let's put it that way, that there is such a thing as free will. Okay, wonderful. and. Um... Okay, Haiku wants to know, why do you, uh, can you give a brief outline of why you criticize S4 and S5 modal logic? And obviously you won't be able to do it in, uh, with the time constraints we have, but uh, if you can get, give like an introductory overview, that would be nice, thank you. Sure, I appreciate the question too. And you're right that I won't be able to give the full argument, but I'll, I'll start this way. <coughs> so there's a question in the philosophy of modal logic. So first of all, modal logic is, the logic of necessity and possibility. Um, and there's not a unanimous opinion about what the logic of necessity and possibility is, what the correct modal logic of necessity and possibility is. Uh, and questions arise even at the level of propositional logic before we even gets to quantificational or quantified modal logic. And that's where the question comes up about S4, S5, T, and, and so on. Um, so the um, it's pretty much agreed upon that the correct logic, the correct propositional modal logic, is going to be at least as strong as a system that's called T. Now in the system T, you have all of the um, all of the tautologies um, as truths of T, and you also have a few modal principles that are specific to modality. One is an inference rule uh, called necessitation, and that is that from any logical truth, you can infer that it's a necessary truth. So if it's a logical truth, then it's also a metaphysically necessary truth. That's the inference rule of necessitation. Um, and then there are a couple of axioms, one of which is if P metaphysically entails Q, that is if it's a necessary truth, that if P then Q. And if furthermore, P is itself a necessary truth, then it's entailed uh, Q is also a necessary truth. 
And then finally, we have uh, another axiom, which is that if P is a necessary truth, then it's true. Any necessary truth is true. Um, that's the basic system of T. Now, people have proposed extensions of T, um, one of which is called the Brouwerish or B system. One is called S4 for system number four, and one is called S5. Those are the main uh, extensions of the basic system T that have been proposed. I think that the current status of things, I'm not sure, but I suspect that the current state of play in the philosophy of modal logic is that uh, most people in the field favor S5. Now, the th and it's, let me say a little bit about why that that's the case, because I think that's wrong. I think um, S5 is definitely not the right logic of um, modality. But it's what can be said about S5 is it's the simplest. It's a, it's a relatively simple system for modal logic um, because um, iterations of modal operators collapse. That is, if you have a string of modal operators in S5, a string of the form possibly, possibly, necessarily, necessarily, possibly, necessarily, necessarily, possibly, possibly, necessarily, and so on. And then it comes to an end. You can drop all of those iterations, except for the last one, just keep the last one. Uh, that will be equivalent. So it's a very simple system. It, it basically removes iterations. They become odios. Um, necessarily, necessarily, just is necessarily. You don't need the two. Possibly, necessarily, that's also just necessarily. You don't need the iteration. Uh, and so it's a very kind of simplistic system uh, to work with. And for that reason, the semantics for S5 is also very simple, or at least relatively simple. Um, and in fact, it's the first way, it, when you start thinking about how to do the semantics for modal logic, um, S5 is a system that will come to mind. Um, that's the simplest semantics, and it will give you um, the axioms for S5. Uh, the, the basic axiom for S5 that you need to add to the system for T is the principle that if P is possibly true, then it's necessary that P is possibly true. If P is possibly true, that can't be an accident. It has to be necessary. Okay. And the, one, the thing that one should notice immediately about this axiom, it doesn't have the ring of being an analytic truth the way the basic axiom of T or both of the basic axioms of T do. So think about the basic axiom of T that if P is a necessary truth, then it's true. If P is necessary, then P is true. That, that feels like an analytic truth. That feels exactly the same to me as if S knows P, then P. Here we've got, if it's necessary that P, then P. And they both feel like straightforward analytic truths. If you doubt, that, we, that whenever something is necessary, then it's true. You, in some obvious sense, don't really understand what necessity is. If you understand what, ne what necessity is, you'll immediately see that anything that's necessary is true. Um, it's just part of our concept of necessity that whatever is necessary is true. And so the basic axiom of T, I think, is a clear and obvious analytic truth. By contrast with that, the characteristic axioms for S4 and B and S5 don't have that feature. They don't even feel analytic. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, it's not at all difficult to come up with models that are plausible models of the universe, plausibly correct about metaphysical modality, uh, which falsify the basic characteristic axioms of B and S4 and S5. And that's basically what I've done. I've published a number of things in which I've tried to make the case as plausible as possible that the axioms, the basic characteristic axioms for, for S4 and S5, and I would even go so far as to say for B, um, are pretty easily falsifiable in what seems like a very coherent um, depiction of modal reality. They just become false in that depiction. Uh, and that depiction that I'm giving in which these things are falsified, um, all that matters is that they be logically coherent. They don't have to be the real universe. All that matters is that it be a logically coherent way uh, for the universe to be, at least with regard to modality. And I think it's very obvious that they are. 
So what my argument amounts to is this, it's at least logically coherent that modal reality falsifies the axioms for S4 and S5, and it's even logically coherent, although I think it's probably false, I think it's logically coherent to suppose that the modal reality falsifies the basic axiom of the system B. By the way, the basic axiom for the system B is that if P is true, then it's necessary that P is possible. So I think you can describe a universe where that even fails, and it's at least logically coherent, although I don't think the universe is like that. I think I think the modal reality probably does respect the B axiom, um, but it's it's coherent logically that it doesn't. Uh, now, I would say nothing like that can possibly be true about the basic system T. There is no way to describe modal reality that falsifies T and is logically coherent. Rather, that would seem to be logically incoherent. And so my ultimate conclusion is that the basic logic for metaphysical modality is in fact T, which is the simplest of these systems that we're talking about. Um, I think the B axiom is probably true as well and probably a necessary truth, but I think it's clearly not an analytic truth. Um, now contrast that with the other axioms for S4 and S5. Those are not even plausibly true, let alone analytic. So uh, I think the basic truth of, the basic reality of metaphysical modality is not gonna be, the logic of it is not gonna be stronger than T. Um, and what else was I gonna say about this? Um, oh, so it turns out that the semantics for T is more complicated than the semantics that we need for S5. We can get to, we can make do with a much more sim simple semantic system for S5 than we can for even, the, even for S4 or, or B uh, or T. <clears throat> and so I think the real reason that people incline towards S5 as opposed to T um, has something to do with the fact that that's the first semantics that came to mind. And people have gotten so used to it, it's, it becomes so entrenched to think that the logic of metaphysical modality is S5 that they think of this as somehow God-given, as if it were um, sacrosanct, as if the burden of proof is on me rather than on them. Um, in fact, the burden of proof is on them to give an argument that something that doesn't seem to be um, logically required is nevertheless a logical truth. Um, I think that puts the burden of proof squarely in the camp of the traditionalist who thinks that the proper logic for metaphysical modality is S5. Rather, I think, um, no, without, without a special argument, all of the plausibility is on the side uh, of my position, which is that the correct logic for metaphysical modality is just T. So I don't know if that's enough, but that's to give you a rough idea of the way I've argued for this. Wonderful. So we have a question from Detroyer uh, who wants to ask about direct reference theory. Suppose someone has no predicate, predicates in mind when they say Socrates. Why think mm -hmm. that they are denoting some man and not merely producing some meaningless sound? Someone m might make the same sound without denoting anything at all. What exactly is it that makes such an utterance a denoting one rather than not? Um, here I would be inclined to say it's, it's partly and heavily um, dependent on our being, our, the, on our use of language, being part of a community in which the language is spoken. And so <coughs> um, the, we, if we use language to communicate with others, um, we are partly responsible to use the language in the way that it has a proper use. Uh, of course, one can, I'm not gonna say that one cannot, um, rebel. One can rebel against the standard uses of words and so on and decide that, oh, no, I'm gonna use them the way I want and I'm gonna use them to mean something different or I'm gonna use them not to mean anything at all. Um, but absent a kind of defiant attitude, 
of that kind, if you don't really think about it in that way, then you are in fact using the words the way, you, let me put it this way. Um, it's incumbent on you to use the words with their standard meaning, unless you make clear that that's not how you're doing it. So um, unless you've given it thought and it actually stated your defiant intention, I think you are responsible for using words in the way that they are properly used. Now, of course, you might misuse them through error and so on, but uh, the words themselves have semantic meaning. And the mere fact that you have learned those words, that you have taken on those words into your own idiolect, um, means that unless you've done something to deviate, they're going to mean in your idiolect what they mean in the language. Um, they're going to have the same meaning in your private version of the language that they have in the language writ large. And so um, even though you may not attach any predicates, in fact, I think um, even if you do attach predicates to uh, a proper name, uh, the meaning of the proper name in the public discourse doesn't have any predicates in it. And so um, neither does it in your idiolect. Wonderful. Um, okay, so Joey Wolf would like to know your position on animal consciousness or animal agency. Again, I haven't thought much about this, uh, but I certainly think that some animals are conscious. I don't know about, I mean, anybody who knows more science than me can help me on this, but you know, I don't know whether a jellyfish has any kind of consciousness, but certainly um, higher mammals have consciousness. I, I don't have any doubt about that. Um, uh, and are they agents? Sure, I think that, you know, dogs and cats and other animals do things and um, do things with um, intentionally, let's say. Um, on the other hand, I am somewhat, um, I am somewhat drawn to the expression, all dogs go to heaven. I somehow feel that dogs don't have the kind of consciousness for which it makes sense to hold them morally responsible for their actions. I do think they're agents. I do think that they do things, that they even have intentional behavior. Um, but I think it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to um, morally judge a dog, for example, for its behavior. Uh, and so even though a dog might, what we think of as misbehavior, it might, might misbehave in some way, um, say it bites somebody or something like that. Um, somehow I feel like, well, look, they're an animal. They're, they're a beast. Um, that's what they do. Um, and you can't really hold them morally responsible. Of course. You may want to train them, and training a dog might involve punishment and reward and that sort of thing, as if you were judging them. And maybe we even do sometimes judge our pets. Um, but I think that they don't have enough consciousness <clears throat> to make that uh, kind of moral judgment make a lot of sense. So yeah, I think they're conscious. I think they do engage in intentional behavior, uh, but I don't think of them as in any in any substantial way, moral agents to be judged by moral standards. As I say, I haven't thought a lot about this, and I haven't certainly haven't written on it, nor do I intend to. But that's my my intention. Uh, Dr. Simon, we have a couple of other questions, but be, rather than proceeding, um, you've been here for an hour, so are you fine with continuing, or would you prefer to round? Yeah, up? let's continue for a few more minutes. Yeah, few more minutes. Okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, so. Um, Several other questions. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Selman, if this question is a bit repetitive, but why do you think uh, that there is a intuitive feeling that, well, I'm recalling the question from memory. I can't seem to find it, but basically the question was, why do you believe that there is uh, this intuitive view that um, when you're saying Hess versus Bosphorus, you're saying something more informative when you're saying that Hess versus Hess versus, what, what do you think explains that? Why does Hesperus' phosphorus sound or seem or feel more informative than Hesperus' is Hesperus? Um, well, uh, so basically I draw a distinction in my book between what I call semantically contained information and pragmatically imparted information. So here's the idea. Um, when you make an utterance, the sentence that you utter has semantic content. 
that content, that proposition that's semantically contained in the sentence that you utter is what I call the semantically contained information. However, the mere fact that you're uttering the sentence also conveys information. The mere fact that you're uttering this very sentence conveys information. It conveys information, for example, that unless you're lying, you, you think this sentence is a true sentence. Um, that's not part of what you're saying, but the person to whom you're speaking will gather from the mere fact that you've uttered this sentence that you're putting forward this sentence as if it were true, as if it were a true sentence. You probably believe that it is a true sentence. And so there's information like that, which is not contained in the sentence. It's not part of what the sentence means or says, but it's information that's conveyed to your audience, to your auditor, um, just by the fact that you've uttered the sentence. Um, also, the fact that it is a sentence is conveyed uh, and so on. There are a lot of other things about the very nature of the speech act that are, that are conveyed to the auditor but are not contained in the sentence itself. So this extraneous information, this additional information, not contained in the sentence itself, but conveyed to the auditor through the mere utterance of the sentence, is what I call pragmatically imparted information. That is, in, the, in uttering the sentence, you impart all kinds of information that is not contained in the sentence itself. So what I want to say is the sentence Hesperus is phosphorus, when uttered, imparts much information that is not actually contained in the sentence itself. And as a matter of fact, on my view, the sentence Hesperus is phosphorus contains no more information and no different information than the sentence Hesperus is Hesperus. Um, so there's not much information. There's some, but not much information contained in the sentence itself. Hesperus is phosphorus. But uttering the sentence conveys lots of information. One of the conveys lots of information that is not contained in the sentence. And one of the propositions or pieces of information that is conveyed in the very utterance of the sentence is that the speaker thinks the sentence is true, maybe even that the sentence is true. Um, well, the truth of the sentence would require that the names Hesperus and Phosphorus co designate, that they be co designated. Um, so that may be part of the information that's conveyed, pragmatically imparted, in the utterance of the sentence. Nothing like that is imparted when one utters Hesperus is Hesperus. Nothing about the word phosphorus is conveyed in the utterance of Hesperus is Hesperus. But when one utters Hesperus is phosphorus, information about the very word phosphorus is thereby conveyed or imparted. So what I want to say is, in uttering a sentence like Hesperus is phosphorus, one imparts or conveys a great deal of information that's not contained in the sentence itself. Some of this information concerns the names Hesperus and phosphorus, for example, that they're co-designated, that these two names designate the same thing, or that there's a single thing designated by these two names. And this imparted information, this information that is pragmatically conveyed and yet not semantically contained, in the sentence, we tend to confuse that for contained information, for semantically contained information. And so we judge the sentence to be informative because of all of this additional information that is conveyed in the utterance of the sentence. The sentence is not informative in the relative, in the, sorry, in the relevant sense. In the relevant sense, it just contains the information that Venus is Venus. But its utterance conveys a lot of additional information and a lot of information that's not conveyed in the mere utterance of Hesperus is Hesperus. So it's, what I want to say is, it's the additional information that is conveyed in the utterance of Hesperus is Phosphorus that leads us to make the mistaken conclusion, to draw the incorrect conclusion, that the sentence is informative in a way that's relevant to Frege's puzzle, in a way that's relevant to semantic content. In fact, it's not. It's not informative in that way. The only way in which it's informative is in connection or in, as pertains to information that is pragmatically imparted rather than semantically contained by uttering the sentence. So that's my explanation in a nutshell as to why we think 
S versus phosphorus is informative when in fact it's not. I see. Uh, thank you so much for that explanation. Dur would like to ask you another question. Uh, hello again. Um, I just wanted to ask what your view was, um, or if you could maybe explain it a bit about um, vagueness. And by vagueness here, I don't mean just semantic vagueness, but ontic vagueness, so things like vague objects and so on. Because you have an argument against um, indeterminate identities, um, but it seems like you think there are um, at least some or some instances where there's no sort of fact of the matter about whether some, for instance, uh, object or property um, actually has vagueness. I just wanted to see if you could maybe expound on that a bit. Yeah. So vagueness is a large topic uh, in philosophy of language. And there seem to be two main camps, uh, maybe three uh, main camps with regard to vagueness. There are prob no doubt other positions that one could take. Um, but the three main positions that I want to cite now are, first of all, epistemicism. Um, that's a very unpopular position. Very few people are inclined towards epistemicism. I think epistemicism is pretty clearly not correct about vagueness. But on the epistemic view of vagueness, um, vagueness is all a matter of ignorance. Um, there is always a sharp dividing line between, let's say, oh, somebody who's wealthy and somebody who's not wealthy, where well, the word wealthy is a vague ex expression. Exactly what does it take to be wealthy? Well, that's somewhat vague. Um, and some people take the position that there's a sharp cutoff as to the difference between being wealthy and not being wealthy, um, but we just don't know what it is. Um, so it's all a matter of ignorance. As I said, I think pretty clearly that's not the case. And so I'm gonna set aside epistemicism and look at the other two main camps with regard to vagueness. So um, probably the most popular view of vagueness is that it's a defect of our representation of the world by means of language. <laughs> our language is in a certain sense incomplete. And it's because of the incompleteness of our language that it doesn't accurately represent the world. On this view, where vagueness is all a matter of representation, um, on this view, the world itself is completely sharply defined. There are no borderline cases in the world. Um, but our language in its attempt to represent the world, because it's incomplete, um, there's all sorts of uh, borderline cases where the language just doesn't have a sharp definition um, that will decide the case in, at hand. So mostly uh, the people who take this line, as I said, I think, there's more or less a consensus about this. I, I disagree with this myself. I, I think this view is just as plainly wrong as epistemicism is, but nevertheless, I think it is the most popular view. On this view, um, vague expressions like wealthy um, don't actually, there's nothing that they actually mean. Rather, there's a range of different precise meanings, which are called precisifications. There's a range of these things, different ones. Um, that are candidates for being the meaning of the word wealthy, but no one of them is privileged. No one of them is what the word actually does mean. In fact, the word is left undecided. It's never been semantically settled which of these precise precisifications the word is to mean. Rather, we're content to let it be undecided. We're content to let it be incomplete, no decision, no choice, no um, can, no stipulations have ever been made to settle what the word is going to mean. Of course, we can. It's not that we're ruled out from doing so. And we often do find ourselves in situations where we're going to narrow the range of precisifications that are candidates for being the meaning of the expression. We often do that, especially for legal reason, we might do that. Um, but it's still, even though we narrow the range, we never pin it down to one specific meaning. So the, the world is precise. Uh, everybody has whatever amount of money they do have, um, and that's precise down to the penny. Um, but the word wealthy has a range of different candidate meanings, none of which is actually the meaning of the expression. So because the language, at least as regards its vague expressions, is incomplete in terms of a semantic meaning, um, for the vague expression, um, there is a kind of 
a disjointed mismatch between the representation, the language, and the world that it represents. As I say, I, I don't think this is correct at all. I think this really just misses the boat. And I think it has the consequence, which the people who endorse the view basically never admit. But I think it has the straightforward consequence that vague expressions do not mean anything. The word like wealthy does not mean anything at all. There's a range of candidates for it to mean, but it doesn't mean any one of those candidates. And so it therefore doesn't mean anything at all. Well, given that fact that most conversational language, not I'm not talking about mathematical language, but most conversational language of everyday natural language has vague expressions in it, this would mean that most of our sentences, almost all of them, don't mean anything. I can't buy that. I think that's just getting it completely wrong. As I said, the people who endorse this view will generally never admit that that's a consequence of the view. But it is. It is a consequence of the view. So what is the other view? It's sometimes called ontic vagueness. And what that means basically is that the world itself, independently of our representation or our attempts to represent it, the world itself suffers from borderline cases. That there are, in fact, because of the nature of the meaning of the word, and, it, and in my view, it does have a meaning, the meaning of the word wealthy is such that there are borderline cases. It's not sharply defined what constitutes being wealthy and what constitutes being not wealthy. There are, in fact, borderline cases. Um, borderline cases are cases in which it's not quite true to say that the person is wealthy, but neither is it quite true to say that the person is not wealthy. Rather, this lies in the borderline between in the, in the sort of um, demilitarized zone between being wealthy and not being wealthy. Um, that's just the nature of the property of being wealthy. The nature of the property is such that there are borderline cases in reality. This has not to, this has not to do with the fact that our language is incomplete. The language is complete. It's just that the concept itself is not fully defined. It's, it is neither true nor false over a certain range of things. And the things over which it's neither true nor false um, are the borderline cases. So my own view is that um, not only is language vague in that in this last way, but that it's obviously that that's the way it is. Language uh, vagueness in language is not a matter of incompleteness or intent or meaninglessness. Rather, it's the nature of the properties that are meant that are expressed by vague language, like words like wealthy. Um, now, when you talk about vague objects, that has to do with um, often that what that means is objects um, that have a vague boundary. Objects such that um, certain little bits of matter, little tiny collections of molecules at their periphery, um, it, it's neither true nor false that they are part of the object or have been lost uh, as a part of the object. Um, well, that I think just shows that the word part, part of is a vague expression in this ontic sense. Um, it has nothing to do with identity, by the way. People often talk about vague objects as if there's something vague about identity. Uh, as far as I can see, it has nothing whatsoever to do with identity. It has to do with the part whole relation. Identity, I think, is just simply not one of the vague expressions. It's not an expression for which there are borderline cases. Vague expressions, paradigmatically, are expressions that have borderline cases. Identity is not that. So that's right. my. Opinion. So just as a really quick follow up, so you wouldn't, if someone made the argument that take um, two instances of some object and draw two different boundaries such that it's not clear, like you mentioned, there's these issues of the problem of the many and so on about where, where to draw the boundaries and so on. And we just ask the question, given these two different ways of drawing on the, the boundaries, are they identical? You would say the answer is no. They're not identical, definitely right. not. But okay. now also I would insist, neither one of them is the object in question. So if the object, well, in the problem of the many, uh, Peter Unger talks about clouds. Uh, right. But you can talk about a table for that matter. Um, and so my point is any sharply, any, any object that has a sharp boundary, it's always either true or false that this is or is not part of the table. 
Um, that's not what the table is. None of those things is, is the table. Those are sharply defined, sharply bordered objects, and they're not ordinary objects. They're not even lumps of matter. They're, they're non-ordinary philosophical objects. Um, I'm not saying there aren't any such things. I'm just saying they're not what we talk about. They're not, they're not what we designate. Um, when we talk about the table, it doesn't have a sharp boundary, period. And so anything you cite with a sharp boundary, that's not going to be the table. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Salman, for being with us and answering all these questions for more than an hour now. Um, I think that we've taken up enough of your time. Uh, we all wish to collectively thank you for your um, participation. We hope this experience was something positive <laughs> um, and uh, you had a um, good experience, I suppose. So are there any concluding thoughts you would like to impart on us? Well, I want to say you're welcome, and I hope it was uh, beneficial for you as well. Wonderful, and we won't take further time. Uh, thanks so much again, and hope to see you soon. Sure, okay. thank you.